So, this video is sponsored by Mubi. Chinese cinema is having a good year right now. In fact, so many good films are coming out, I can hardly keep up. It feels like the end of an era. After a decade of uneven performance, Chinese blockbusters have finally found its footing. I almost feel bad for taking up the past. You see, in the 2010s, back when Chinese cinema was still on the rise, three unholy movies ruled the memedom. There is Pure Hearts, the incoherent sexist indie production where the director sued a review platform for bad reviews. And there is The Autobots, a poorly made ripoff of a Disney classic allegedly made to scam government funding. But there is one final piece of shit to complete the trinity. Switch, a proper big budget blockbuster with big name stars like Andy Lau and Lin Zhiling. And it is so bad, both lead actors publicly apologized. Look, I held up on talking about this movie for a long time, partly because I don't want to be known as that guy who talks about Chinese movies, but mainly because I just don't want to watch it. Still, it is the last of the trilogy I haven't talked about, and it deserves to be discussed, as the film is symptomatic of a time when Chinese cinema was lost, confused, and wrapped in insecurity. Oh, and the movie did gangbusters at the box office too. So get ready to feel like you have just washed your eyes with toilet water. This is the final boss of bad Chinese blockbusters. Switch is a 2013 spy action thriller about a police special agent and his mission to protect a set of two paintings from being stolen by various criminal organizations. Sounds simple, but due to the sloppy editing, the film is extremely confusing to watch. So instead of a concise summary, I'll attempt to recap it in a way most representative of my viewing experience. You ready? Okay, so the movie begins with two groups of criminals fighting each other, trying to steal one part of the ink paintings. And while this is happening, the film also intercuts to questionable imagery in number one, the boss of the Japanese gang. With one scroll stolen, the Chinese police decides to relocate the other scroll, but not before questionable imagery number two. And then suddenly, Lin Zhiling on a river, dudes on a river. They fight, the scroll ended up stolen too. Who got it? Not explained. We then come to questionable imagery number three. I'm just gonna leave it on screen for a bit. I wonder how many people missed out because they only listened to my videos. Anyway, with both parts of the scroll gone, it is up to our hero, police agent Andy Lau, to get it back. He teams up with a new partner, Taiwanese model Lin Zhiling, often regarded as one of the hottest Asian women in the 2000s. You may recognize her from Red Cliff. The mission took them just 10 minutes of screen time, and Andy Lau even escapes with a pretty sick stunt. We then have a pointless scene that lets me thanks today's sponsor, Mubi. Andy Lau heads to the drop-off point, gets ambushed, stops Lin Zhiling, and then gets stopped himself. Turns out it was all a trap set up by the Japanese gang. Lin Zhiling is a Japanese spy, which we already knew. Three months later, surprise, he's alive. Surprise, she's alive. Surprise, she's a nun? What's the point of all that? Now it's a mission for his redemption. Andy, his wife, yes he has a wife, and Lin Zhiling team up. Why is Lin Zhiling part of the team? I guess because she's hot. The mission is successful, but surprise, they got shot. Surprise, they survived. Evidently, nothing turns a woman on quite like a life and death situation, because after being shot, Lin Zhiling confesses her love to Andy. The next day, Andy's wife gets kidnapped. And you know what that means? Yes, she confesses her love too. To take back the second part of the scroll, Andy confronts the Japanese gang. Questionable imageries number 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then is the climactic battle. The hero wins, and then it's revealed at the end that the scroll they have been chasing all this time is a forgery. The real one has been kept safe by the police this entire time. The end. You lost? Good, now you're part of the audience. 
It's kind of weird of a movie sponsorship in the middle of a video about a bad movie. Movie's curated catalog seems to be anything but bad, but there are some gems in there too. Bad but entertaining and culturally relevant films available for you to stream. Here's what's available in Canada, for example. We have Plan 9 from Outer Space, the OG worst movie of all time, before The Room, before even Troll 2. You see? You see? Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! We have The Bat Woman, a Mexican classic in which a bikini-clad bat woman fights a fish man. It would be my favorite movie if I was still a teenager. <laughs> and we also have Miami Connection, a must-watch for any kung fu movie enthusiast. Or, you know, you can just watch countless other good movies on Mubi. If you are interested, I mean, how could you not? You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinema. That's M-U-B-I slash cinema for a whole month of great cinema. For real though, Mubi is genuinely amazing. I wouldn't be this exciting about a sponsorship otherwise, and I really do recommend it. So, if you want to experience the beautiful world of cinema in all of its colors and flavors, check out the link below and give Mubi a try. Understandably, Switch was lampooned by critics and viewers alike. People called it the worst of the worst, exclaiming they couldn't endure 20 minutes of it. The best way I can put it? is that it is uniformly and impeccably bad. Firstly, there's the nonsensical editing. I already tried my best to express it, but here is a specific example. In this scene, Lin Shiling tells Andy Lau that the Japanese gang will kidnap his son. The film then cuts immediately to his son approached by the gang boss. 10 seconds later, he is immediately rescued by his mother. Another 20 seconds later, it is revealed that the mom is actually Andy Lau in disguise. What the f***? It's like the movie thinks this mass review is the most exciting part of a spy movie, so it just cuts straight to it, not realizing you have to work for the suspense. Oh, and in the next scene, the kids were kidnapped anyway. How? No idea. The movie just wanna look cool, it doesn't care how. Secondly, the gaudy aesthetic. The whole movie looks like those sleazy nightclubs that were inspired by the hall mirrors in Versailles. The holographic VFX is uninspired too. I mean, what is he even doing? Just scrolling through the image? Not to mention the porn costume. She's supposed to be in disguise, as a nurse. What nurse dressed like that? Yui Hatano? Actually, this movie is full of women. Every location has women lined up in the background, clad in cheap costumes, showing their bodies, entertaining men. It looks so much like a nightclub where local barons would pick escorts of a lineup. And just like those clubs, none of these women speak. That brings us to our last point. The constant misogyny. I swear to Bill Nye this whole script sounds like it was written by a human trafficker who docks himself to the police after an online argument with a Swedish former teenager. Jesus Christ. The movie uses a lot of misogynistic images to show that the bad guys are bad. But there's always this undertone that they are supposed to be cool bad, that they are powerful because they control women. Every man is accompanied by a hot chick, and they are the most literal interpretation of a trophy. They are perpetually amused by their men and have little to no dialogue. The two female leads only speak to each other in a short scene, and of course, the only thing they talk about is Andy Lau. <laughs> this movie fails the backdoor test with surgical precision. It's genuinely impressive. All of that was but a taste of how bad the movie is, but now, let's talk about why this movie is bad. Here is why the director made this movie. Quote, People are tired of foreign blockbusters and are tired of Chinese indie productions. 
it's time for a blockbuster made in China. In other words, this movie is made specifically to emulate Hollywood spy movies. When you think of spy movies, what comes to mind? For me, it's the globetrotting adventure. Be it James Bond or Mission Impossible, the colorful locations, rich with history and culture, are always beautifully shown. It's often a stereotypical portrayal, but at least you can feel the location. When Switch goes to Tokyo or Dubai, however, all it ever shows is money. Well, look how rich the place is. This obsession with wealth, class, and grandeur is one of many symptoms of the Chinese vanity culture. Face remains a big part of Chinese social intercourse. Your ability to show off affects your social standing. Everyone is encouraged to keep up with the Joneses. And as China's economy grew, the material competition only intensified. Thus, words like Bai Fu Mei or Gao Shui Fu entered the public lexicon. Women are valuable if they are pale, rich, and beautiful. Men are valuable if they are tall, handsome, and rich. People of mediocre standing are mocked as diao si, kind of like calling someone a basement dweller. What happens if you can afford a Gucci bag? You buy a fake one. You skip the hard work and add it straight to the rewards. You flaunt your wealth and your power over women, desperately trying to convince the world that you are a winner, not a winner. And so the mentality manifested in this film. It has to have the most amount of chicks, the most famous handsome men as the lead, match with the best looking women as the love interest. Everything must be bigger, louder, shinier, more colorful. Boobs has to be big. Cleavage has to be deep. The movie tries really hard not to lose. There's also a pursuit of a vague European classiness. Even though the final fight is between a Chinese spy and a Japanese criminal, they choose fencing because it's an exotic European sport. To this day, many people in East Asia still internalize the notion that Europe is or was the center of civilization, wealth, and high society. Be it insecurity or vanity, at the time, it's all too common for people to want to prove their worth by comparing themselves with others. In this case. The film compares itself to Hollywood, but in a race, you are supposed to run towards the finish line, not chase after other people. As pointed out at the beginning of the video, the other beginning of the video, Chinese cinema is having a pretty good year. You know why? Because none of these movies are trying to show off. It has been almost five years since I made a video asking why Chinese blockbusters are so bad, and since then the industry has come a long way. I first noticed the change when I watched Hai Ma, a genuinely touching personal story that embraces everything Chinese. Since then, many more filmmakers have learned to tell their stories. This year alone, we have a courtroom drama that broke Hong Kong box office record, a couple of VFX films that are based on Chinese stories. And a sci-fi mockumentary that has since become my favorite Chinese film in the past five years. We are seeing a surge of amazing movies, all of which I can't wait to share with you all. See you next time.